And I would also like to share that for the moment, everybody's um, unmuting privileges are revoked, but throughout the um, th throughout the lecture, I will um, you can unmute yourself if you need to, but there is going to be a Q&A section as well. So we're going to give people approximately like two more minutes to join us and then we'll go ahead and get started started with this amazing discussion we have with one of our newest ethnic studies professor, Jose Samuel. And feel free to drop in the chat um, your name, your pronouns, and what brings you to our discussion today. Okay, just one more minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started and we'll let um, our campus community filter in. So um, th once again, welcome to Ethnic Studies Explained with Professor Zamora. And to give you a little bit of background, Jose Zamora is an Associate Professor of Ethnic Studies at Chasey College. He was a first-generation college student and received his degrees from CSU Fullerton. He believes that there is a place for everyone in ethnic studies and teaches his classes to be inclusive and welcoming. His research topics include men and masculinity, ethnic studies, futurism, and creative expressions in ethnic studies. His favorite ethnic studies books include Pedagogy of the Oppressed, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Black Skin, White Mask, and The Will to Change. So without further ado, here is Professor Jose Zamora. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, for my students who are here, um, thank you for coming, right? Um, I wanted to keep Today's dialogue, um, not basic, but uh, yeah, I guess you can call it basic. And from there, if you wanted to learn more, you can go ahead and ask me or my colleague, uh, Professor Patricia Gomez, who's also in the audience, um, if you have any other questions. There will be a dedicated question and answer period at the end. Uh, for my students who are here, um, this area that you have to screenshot is also at the end of the presentation. So. Once you screenshot that, you can send it to me for your extra credit. But um, I usually don't like using PowerPoint, but for today, I'm going to. So here we go. So I chose to title this presentation, Ethnic Studies Explained. Um, I like to do art, uh, just as one of the things I like to do, right? So for those of you who know, this is the moon goddess, Koyo Shaokui. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that later. But um, the main point of this presentation today is to clarify what ethnic studies is and what ethnic studies is not. Right now, ethnic studies is under attack in a majority of the United States, but here in California, we're celebrating it, we're embracing it. So we'll cover a little bit of all of that. And I know to the Chafee College community, uh, this is the first semester ever where ethnic studies has been offered. So. Hopefully we can clarify a little bit more about what ethnic studies is. So now going a little bit forward, um, my name is Jose Samora. You can call me Jose, it doesn't really matter. Um, I graduated from Cal State Fullerton with my master's degree in American studies. My parents are both immigrants from Mexico. My dad's side is from Michoacan and my mom's side is from Zacatecas. Uh, like many of you, I'm a first generation college student. I had no one to help me. Um, I remember going to my parents about financial aid and they're like, oh, sorry, mijo, we don't know. Maybe you can go and ask someone at your high school, right? Um, I got my bachelor's degrees in Chicanx studies and black studies at Cal State Fullerton. And then, like I said, my master's in American studies. Um, like we said a little bit earlier, like Sandra said a little bit earlier, some of my favorite books are How to Be an Anti-Racist by Dr. Kendi, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, The Will to Change. Um, and it's actually two part books, Black Skin, White Mass and Wretched of the Earth, which is about colonialism. And just 
to kind of humanize what ethnic studies is, um, on the right here is me getting my bachelor's degree from Cal State Fullerton. You can see my Mecha stash. We actually have a Mecha here at Chafee College if you're interested in getting involved. But this is my abuelita, uh, my grandmother who raised me. While my parents were working, she was taking care of me. She's almost 100 years old now. Um, and it was really proud that I was the first member of our family to go to college. Um, I'm her favorite. So she got to see me walk not just once, but twice right, with my bachelor's and then with my master's. Um, but like many of you, school, especially university and colleges can be very overwhelming places, very daunting places. And, oops, excuse me, um, at times I felt kind of like out of place, kind of dumb, isolated. And sometimes I didn't feel like going to school. I felt very, like it was hopeless. And I remember the first ethnic studies class that I took at Cal State Fullerton, I became instantly hooked. It was a um, an ancient Mexican culture class, which is where, where we got to learn about like the Aztecs, the Maya, the Purepecha, the Olmec. And I was learning about this for the first time. Uh, my parents never really taught me anything about that. But I tell people, it's I felt like I just woke up from the matrix. Um, and I was like, whoa, I see the world in a very different light. Um, a lot of my life began to make sense. And I felt like, I, will, I found a part of me that I was missing. And I know that a lot of you are probably like, well, why is this so influential, right? Why is ethnic studies so, um, so influential to him? So just really quickly, straight from the UC Berkeley Department of Ethnic Studies, ethnic studies is the critical and interdisciplinary study of race, ethnicity, and ind indigeneity with a focus on the experiences and perspectives of people of color within and beyond the United States. So this is a very, um, a very basic definition of what ethnic studies is. We do a lot more than just this. Um, and this is copied and pasted straight from the UC Berkeley uh, homepage. So if you're interested in studying ethnic studies, UC Berkeley is a great place to do that, as is San Francisco State. Um, I went to Cal State Fullerton to do that, but ethnic studies is now requirement to graduate at the Cal State. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But if you wanna study ethnic studies, you have options. It's not just in limited places. And um, what I like to tell my classes on the first day of class is that ethnic studies is ultimately the study of humans, how we are dehumanized, right? The systems and the processes that dehumanize us and how we are humanized, right? How can we become human again? And oftentimes this involves protests, this involves revolution, this involves people not letting themselves be dehumanized. And to go a bit forward from there, um, you might, be wondering like, what are these different uh, signs that we have up here? So for each one of the slides, or as many as I could, um, I took a symbol from ethnic studies and I simplified it, right? So I removed the background and such, but this is from the American Indian movement. This one is um, Jose? Yellow, yellow peril. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no you're, you stopped sharing your screen. Oh, so we can't see the presentation. Really? That was weird. There we go. Can you all see it okay? okay? Yeah. Huh. That's never happened to me before. But um, at, on the top right here, you'll see um, what's often called yellow peril. And yellow peril uh, during the civil rights movement was often in support of what we now call Black Lives Matter. Now, going a bit forward to ethnic studies areas of study, um, we're constantly changing and we are pushing limits as to what we can study. And currently at the Cal State, um, there are areas of uh, general education. Ethnic studies is now area F. Within ethnic studies, we have four major areas of study. That include African-American studies, which is sometimes called Black studies. We have Asian-American studies, uh, Chicanx studies, which is sometimes called Latinx studies, and we have Native American studies. And I just want to say that there is so much more that we study than just these four areas. And we're considered interdis interdisciplinary. So we pull a little bit from everywhere in order to make a more comprehensive area of study. Now, um, of course, this is these four major areas are the way that the state of California chose to, um, to divide ethnic studies. Now, as far as why is this important, um, the American educational system has historically been one of segregation and exclusion. And let me just give you a couple of examples. So for those of you who are not aware, um, in the United States towards the end of the 1800s, 
into the 1970s, the Native American boarding school movement would literally kidnap Native American children, take them from their families and from their homes, and oftentimes take them halfway across the country and put them into schools called boarding schools, right? The whole point of this was to Americanize and colonize Native peoples. The official motto for this movement was kill the Indian, save the man. Now, a little bit forward, whenever we think of segregation, we think of Black people, right, of Black students. And um, this is kind of like something that you all really uh, have drilled into you in, in high school and in middle school, that separate can never be equal. It's inherently unequal. And for Mexicans here in, the United, here in California, um, a little bit of, that we talk about in ethnic studies is that Mexicans and other, quote, Hispanics, uh, we don't like using that word, but uh, that those people are legally considered white persons under U.S. law, right? So it was illegal to segregate white people from white people, but what was argued is that Mexicans have a cultural deficit, right? So what they would do is put Mexican students into other schools called Mexican schools. And for those of you who know your history on this one, um, Mendez versus Westminster in 1947 desegregated California several years before Brown versus Board of Education. Mendez versus Westminster was actually used as evidence in Brown versus Board of Education. And to go a little bit forward from here, um, ethnic studies and the civil rights movement are often con considered what we call decolonial movements. For those of you who are aware, uh, Europe went out into the world and colonized, basically took part of all across, all across Africa, Asia, Latin America. They took a little piece of it for themselves. So if you're wondering why do Mexicans speak Spanish, it's because they were colonized by the Spanish. Why do people in Vietnam speak French, right? Older people in Vietnam, it's because they were colonized by the French. As you can see here, um, people never just kind of took it. The people always fought back. It wasn't, it wasn't welcomed, as many people might like to argue. And just a little bit of context to this, um, after World War II, Europe is in shambles because of the war. So they start to lose control of their colonies overseas. And many, um, many Latin American countries have their um, independence days in September. And many African countries also have, um, I guess, like back-to-back -back independence movements. Because as one colony uh, gained independence, another one would immediately gain independence right next door to it. Um, many scholars initially, uh, what we would call a decolonial theory or colonial theory, eventually become the basis for ethnic studies. These are scholars like Franz Fanon, Albert Memmi, Amy Sasser, Vine Deloria. Um, this is often seen as our way of writing back against um, a very racist, interpretation of the colonies, if you will, and their peoples. And as one of my favorite scholars, Franz Fanon says, when we revolt, it's not for a particular culture. We revolt simply because for many reasons, we can no longer breathe. And going on to the United States, if you can remember, you can uh, recognize Malcolm X here in the top right. Um, the civil rights movement in the United States is often considered a decolonial movement. And um, in 1969, the College of Ethnic Studies was fought for in the Bay Area. Um, San Francisco State is often considered one of the first ethnic studies programs in the country, if not the world. And to go a bit forward from here, this is important because today, as I'm talking, 36 U.S. states out of 50 have in some way banned ethnic studies. And the first time that ethnic studies was banned was in 2009 in the state of Arizona. There's actually a really good documentary called Precious Knowledge, which uh, covers that. We actually show that in our classes. Um, and since then, 36 states have enacted bans. At the beginning of this semester, so in the summer, it was only 23 states. So you can see um, it's picking up momentum across the United States, right? Um, and if you ask a lot of conservatives in this country, you know, about ethnic studies, they probably don't even know what ethnic studies is. They refer to it by a different name. They call it critical race theory or CRT. Now, first off, critical race theory is an actual thing. 
right? It is a cross-disciplinary examination by social and civil rights scholars and activists to explore how laws, social and political movements and media shape and are shaped by social conceptions of race and ethnicity. Now, what I wanted to do here um, is to show you a couple of videos. Uh, we'll get to them in a bit, but why are they choosing to call ethnic studies critical race theory? Critical race theory fits within ethnic studies, but ethnic studies itself is not completely critical race theory. But if you look at it, critical race theory sounds scary, right? So it's often been targeted as the educational boogeyman for the far right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two videos um, on opposite sides of the political spectrum, and let's see what you have to say. I won't show you all of it, uh, but just most of it. But here's the first one. So all over the country, beginning early last June, school curricula have changed completely and become explicitly political and openly racist. And most parents have just sat there on their hands and watched it happen and watched their kids hurt by it. But one group of parents in Loudoun County, Virginia, right outside Washington, is fighting back against all of this, against a curriculum that teaches their kids to hate their country and to judge their classmates based on how they look, on their skin color. Several parents had the courage to say this publicly a few days ago at a school board meeting. Watch. CRT is not an honest dialogue. It is a tactic that was used by Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan on slavery very many years ago to dumb down my ancestors so we could not think for ourselves. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. Let me educate you. An honest dialogue does not impress, oppress. An honest dialogue does not implement hatred or injustice. It's to communicate with deceiving, without deceiving people. Today, we don't need your agreement. We want action in the backbone for what we ask for today, to ban CRT. I had to come down. Okay, so really quick. Um, I took a part of what she said and I wrote it down just so that we can see it, right? She says that CRT is not an honest dialogue. It is a tactic that was used by Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan on slaveries. She says slaveries. Uh, very many years ago to dumb down my ancestors so that we could not think for ourselves. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. Um, I'm not sure how Hitler would have used CRT if CRT didn't exist when Hitler was around. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it to me the way that this that this reads is she was probably paid a lot of money to read something, right? Now consider that as I show you the next video where you actually hear from critical race theory scholars. The whole purpose of critical race theory is to provide Americans with a way to understand the legacy of racism, even though those stories sometimes hurt. It's anti-American training that vilifies white people and demands they apologize. The best learning for students about social studies and about our democracy and our country is the learning where students can really grapple with the issues and really come to a deeper understanding of how our past informs our present. All of this revisionist woke curriculum, you are not going to do this to our children. Teachers across the country are caught in the middle of the latest flashpoint in America's culture war, critical race theory. So what exactly is it? And why is there a push to ban it in schools? Critical race theory is a body of ideas and a set of approaches to understanding the history and the present of American society that looks at the ways in which racial unfairness have been woven into the fabric of our institutions. In other words, critical race theory, or CRT for short, is a legal academic framework centered on the idea that racism is systemic. It first started to coalesce in the 1970s when Black, Hispanic, and Asian legal scholars were researching the persistence of inequality despite the landmark legal victories of the civil rights era. The legal scholars undertook a set of analyses and investigations that were aimed at trying to make sense of the puzzling persistence of racism in our legal system, in our political system, uh, in our economy. 
CRT has been studied in fields like sociology, economics, and political science. It's been used to examine issues such as housing and educational segregation, unconscious bias, and criminal justice reform. Contrary to what often critics portray as sort of judging people intrinsically as being racist or not, or make, or holding people responsible for, you know, uh, slavery in the past. It is actually to open up a conversation of how we all inherit and live in a society sort of beyond our choosing, right? We didn't choose where we were born or what racial group we were part of, and yet we have this common history. How do we understand that history? What does it mean for us? Those are the sorts of questions that critical race theorists were trying to grapple with. The racial reckoning spurred by the police killing of George Floyd brought the decades-old framework back into the spotlight as some schools sought to implement reforms that better address race in classrooms. I think the thing that critical race theory would add to that conversation is that we not sort of confine that horrific example to Derek Chauvin, but to think about how, well, there were other law enforcement officers present including officers of color who stood idly by. And so that pushes us to think about, you know, this phenomenon as not simply one of, you know, racism by whites against blacks, right? I mean, it makes us think more, you know, more critically, more engaged, more seriously around well, why do these practices happen? The push against CRT gained steam under former President Trump when he directed federal agencies to end any diversity trainings related to critical race theory. Though ultimately blocked on First Amendment grounds and rescinded by President Biden, the fight over CRT at the state level is still in full effect. The focus on CRT is a way to latch onto a concept that very few people sort of really understand, which sounds kind of scary perhaps to someone not, you know, uh, trained in what it means and latch onto that as a kind of football in this sort of ongoing fight over you know, the future of this country with regard to racism. As of mid-June 2021, 21 states have introduced bills attempting to restrict the teaching of critical race theory and or impose limits on how race is discussed inside the classroom. And those limits are often vague. And instructors, educators, especially at the K through 12 level, will just not go there, will not run the risk of upsetting parents, or, you know, I'm being misunderstood or drawing the ire of, you know, lawmakers. In Texas, for instance, House Bill 3979 says teachers must explore current events from multiple positions without giving, quote, deference to any one perspective. There's language in this bill, like teachers need to present a balanced perspective on current events, for instance. You know, they have to, they have to do their due diligence to present multiple viewpoints. But what happens if they're talking about an issue in the classroom and they tried to present multiple viewpoints, but you know, the student comes home and tells their parent about the lesson that day and the parent says, thinks, well, they didn't do a good enough job of prevent presenting this viewpoint. So who decides when the teacher has done an adequate job of presenting mul multiple perspectives on an issue? It saddens me and disappoints me that instead of really embracing this opportunity to confront our nation's past and to tell authentic and more accurate narratives about experiences of you know diverse people in this country that we're looking to sweep it under the rug we're looking to erase it even further from our memories educator okay so Picking up where this video left off, I want to give you a couple of examples. Um, one is from the state of Texas. So the state of Texas, it is the state where most textbooks in the United States are produced, right? So they have to be made somewhere, right? Texas is that state. Now in Texas, um, there are laws that govern how textbooks are produced. And there are very slight differences in the way that we would talk about certain topics and the way that they would talk about certain topics. So in Texas, for instance, new history books about American history don't use the word slave. They use the word worker. And there is a very, very big difference psychologically between the word slave and between the word worker. And in Montana, in Montana, they the way that they talk about Native American reservations and genocide that accompanies that 
is they'll say things like um, the colonists asked the Native Americans to move and the Native Americans agreed. End of story, period, moving on, right? Now, we'll get to that a little bit later, but to go a little bit forward as to talking about California, California, for those of you who are not aware, has recently passed a mandate to make ethnic studies a graduation requirement in California schools, right? California is one of 17 states to have such mandates. Now, to go a bit forward, excuse me, um, this, uh, this law is called Assembly Bill 101, so AB 101, that Governor Newsom signed in October of 2021 that made it a requirement, but it's not like Newsom came up with this out of nowhere, right? This movement has been going on for more than 20 years for people to understand their history from their own perspective. Um, Newsom had rejected the bill a couple of times prior and 101 was the one that made it through, right? Through protests, through the movement of people that actually want to know their own histories. And uh, for those of you who are planning on transferring to a Cal State, um, ethnic studies is now a graduation requirement at the Cal States. You could take our classes here at Chafee College to satisfy that requirement, but that area is called area F. So there's A through F, right? Now, as far as the founding of Chafee College's ethnic studies department, um, Chafee College doubled down on ethnic studies by hiring two of us. So that's my colleague, uh, Professor Patricia Gomez, who's actually in the audience right now, and myself, right, Professor Jose Zamora. Um, and the interesting thing about the way that other departments are hiring is they are either hiring one professor, right, just dedicated ethnic studies, or they're hiring one professor and housing them in another department. So for instance, um, they'll hire them, they'll put them in the sociology department, and they'll say half the time you teach ethnic studies, half the time you teach sociology. But here at Chafee College, right, and to credit Chafee College, we have two dedicated fa full-time faculty members just teaching ethnic studies. And we're looking to hire sometime in the near future. So we are on track to becoming one of the biggest ethnic studies departments in the region, right? As far as community colleges are concerned. And um, if not, the Inland Empire. But to go a little bit forward for the future of ethnic studies, um, so we can get to question and answer, um, some questions that we have to consider are we often say that it's not enough to just have a faculty person of color. You have to. I guess, live that, right? You have to live ethnic studies. So the reason why I'm putting this here is I used to teach um, dual enrollment classes at a high school in Orange County. And what they eventually did is they didn't renew my contract. And what they did is they had the football coach go and teach the ethnic studies class. And the qualifier was, oh, you're Mexican, right? You can teach Chicano studies. Yeah, no, you have to have faculty who are competently trained in this and who have the appropriate degrees in order to teach this properly. Some other things that we should consider about ethnic studies is as we move into the cybernetic age, how will racism change and how must ethnic studies change in order to meet that? And as we um, grapple with what we call artificial intelligence and uploaded intelligences, that will also change the dynamics of race, class, and gender. And honestly, how, like, how do we deal with racist AI and racist robots? Most people think that my phone can't be racist or my computer can't be racist, right? But I guarantee you that we are going to have to deal with this much sooner than we think. And from there, um, since you know we're only here for an hour, I really wanted to dedicate a lot of time to question and answer. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and let's just go straight to question and answer. Thank you, Jose, for that amazing um, Ethnic Studies 101, it felt like for me. Um, so anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Let's see, don't be shy. Ooh, extra credit to Professor Zamora's students. Okay, we see we have Chris. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra, if you want to manage those. Yeah. 
All right, Chris, so feel free to unmute yourself or write your question in the chat. Hey, uh, yeah, my question is, I was just wondering, is there any, any kind of movements or any kind of anything in process to kind of make changes to the way that history is written in textbooks right now across the country? So, uh, so there is, right? So a uh, short answer is there is, um, but it's extremely messy. Um, the push for ethnic studies isn't just to create ethnic studies disciplines or ethnic studies programs. It's also to change the way that we are teaching our students, right? And that's from every single class, K through 12. Um, ethnic studies curriculum can be incorporated in just about any, um, any subject, right? Whether it's math, health sciences, or history, right? History often tends to be uh, one of the most divisive. Um, and oftentimes, you will see a very different approach to history in the state of California, as you will in the state of Arizona, as you will in the state of New Mexico, Texas, et cetera. So each state kind of does it differently. Um, one thing that's happening here in the state of California, so for, for you and me, when we were kids, we learned about the mission system, right? If you remember that. And we probably went, you know, it was like fourth grade, right? You probably went to Michael's and you bought like the materials and you built it. Um, when we were kids, it was taught in a, oh, wow, this is very cute. Look how beautiful this is, et cetera. Now, what we've seen is there's a shift into talking about the realities of the missions, right? The missions were sites of colonization where there are mass graves, uh, lynchings of Native Americans would happen. Um, and the other thing that they don't tell you, the missions routinely burnt down, right? So it's like, why are they burning down, right? So yes, there is a movement to, I guess, um, to diversify the way that we talk about history, but it depends on where you are. Now, the other thing um, here in the state of California, we are doing um, more than anywhere, everywhere else, but for a lot of us, it's not enough, right? If we're going to commit to this, we should commit to this. So thank you for asking that question, Chris. Um, Jenna has a question. Um, what opportunities are there for those with ethnic studies degrees? So oftentimes when we when we think about degrees, we think like this plus this equals this, right? So if I get a if I get a degree in history, then I have to become a historian, right? Which is not true, right? Um, think of a degree as a tool as, So think of a degree as a tool. You can use a hammer for multiple things. You can use a screwdriver for multiple things. It doesn't have to directly translate to this one thing, if that makes sense. So for instance, in ethnic studies, um, if we're teaching our students how not to be sexist, how not to be racist, that is extremely applicable to all areas of life. So for instance, my wife um, is an elementary school teacher. She teaches in Orange County. She got her degree in ethnic studies and she got her degree, uh, she double majored in child and adolescent development. So here she is coming with an ethnic studies background and she knows how to work with kids. So now she's a kindergarten teacher at a predominantly Latino school. So she knows how to engage not only the students themselves, but also the community that's around there. So routinely, a lot of the Latino parents who only speak Spanish will go, go and request my wife by name. Right, because they've heard, you know, she's really good. Right, she, uh, yeah, she, my wife is just a really good teacher. Um, but for those of you who want to go into business, one of the last examples that I'll give you is every single year, whether publicly or privately, businesses and individuals shell out hundreds of millions of dollars in lawsuits. Right. So imagine if you come with your ethnic studies degree and your business degree and you go work at some big company somewhere, right? Imagine that you become a manager or mid-level management at this company and you make changes at that company to prevent all of these different lawsuits, right? That would make you completely indisposable, right? That would make you valuable at this place, right? Whereas our competitors, they're getting sued left and right for this and that. It's like, no, 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 we fixed those problems a long time ago. And it's this person with the ethnic studies degree that came and did that. Right. And uh, there's another question. Um, will you need an advanced degree as a doctorate? So I have a master's degree, right? I have two bachelor's degrees and a master's. Um, I have plenty of colleagues who have PhDs in ethnic studies. It really depends on what you want to do. 
And that's something that myself or my colleague, uh, Professor Gomez can talk to all of you about one-on-one. -on -one. So if you, if you come to our office hours, we'll typically ask you like, hey, how are you? Like, tell me about yourself. What do you wanna do? And oftentimes students will be majoring in the wrong thing, right? Like if I tell them, if they tell me like, oh, I wanna do this, right? And I'm like, well, why are you majoring in this over here? Oh, it's because I thought I was supposed to do that. It's like, no, you can do something completely different. And um, in this changing economy, I can't tell you what the economy is gonna look like at the end of the week, right? Let alone when you graduate in four years, five years, however long you wanna take. Um, so I think to use video game logic, we are going to level you up the best that we can for the person that you are, right? So if you have a certain set of interests and you have a certain th set of things that you wanna do, we'll give you the, a very honest and very thorough path on how to get there, right? Maybe instead of majoring in math, you should be majoring in computer science, et cetera. But thank you for asking these questions. These are really good questions. And to my students, thank you. Um, anyone else have any other questions for myself or maybe for Professor Gomez, who's also in the audience? What is ethnic studies? What can I do with it? I have a question. Um, so you shared in your presentation how in some, and, and like you mentioned, in some states, they reworded such as instead of using slaves, they use workers. Um, what is your perspective on why that is being done? And what, and what are your views on it? So there is power in language and the type of language that we use, how we use it, um, when we use it. And my wife and I are watching the new Lord of the Rings show on Amazon Prime. And one of the things that they play with in Lord of the Rings is that people forget history, right? Because all the people that were there are no longer around and certain things just kind of fade into memory. And eventually you will have people telling a completely different story than what actually happened, right? So if we start saying worker instead of slaves, that subtly communicates the message that those people didn't really have it that bad, right? Because when we, when we say worker, you often think, oh, this person had all of these different protections and they were paid, et cetera. When we know that slavery, chattel slavery in the United States was one of the most brutal systems to ever have existed, right? And chattel slavery could not have happened had it not been for the gen genocide of Native Americans. And if we want to fix these problems that we have in the United States today, we first have to confront our very ugly past. And when things keep happening, like a police officer kills two unarmed black men, right? How could this happen? This is not who America is. If we take a look at American history, it tells a very, very different story, right? And I don't want my children to grow up in a world of that. I want my children to grow up in a better world, right? So how do we do that? A part of that is to confront our own past, right? And to tell a very honest and have a very honest conversation about what it was like and what it currently is like now. To answer your question, Sandra. Sorry. Yes, it does. Thank you. So the floor is open. If anyone else has any questions, yes, we have Please, a question. Go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. Hi, my name is Najla Isabi. I'm an adjunct counselor here at Chafee College. So um, my question is, since we are teaching ethnic studies, but ethnic studies in critical race theory is the same thing, correct? I'm not making a mistake. No, um, critical race theory fits within ethnic studies. Like sometimes, depending on what professors you ask, we could teach it. Mm -hmm. um, but critical race theory originally came out of law schools. Right. So if we're looking at how do we study Brown versus Board of Education, that would be from a critical race theory perspective. Right. Now, the same thing like uh, history, you, we don't just study one limited thing. Right. You can expand it. And the way that you what you focus on, how you focus on it. Um, think about it that way. So critical race theory fits within ethnic studies, but critical race theory is, is not it's not directly equal. Right. Even though we do a lot of the same things, if that makes sense. 
Okay, that's why I was confused because you know I've been reading articles and all of that, especially with this, uh, you know, overall about critical race theory. As you said, it is uh, um, the the monster that you know mm -hmm. um, that has been portrayed on the news. So that's why I was like, okay, because I, I'm when I'm planning for my students, their education plan, and I put the ethnic studies as a graduation requirement, and some are like, why I have to take it. I mean, and I'm, I try to explain that, yeah, this is a new section and all of those, and that's part of the graduation. And, and, and some of them, they are like, okay, is that a critical race theory? And I'm like, well, there are some topics probably within ethnic studies about, you know, critical, and, and I was like, okay, I need to attend this so I can learn how to explain this. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes. So thank you. Thank yeah, you for clarifying that. Yeah, and one of the things that we often tell our students in ethnic studies is go and do your own research, right? We'll teach you how to do that. And um, what you hear on TV is often incorrect, especially on certain news outlets, right? Like Fox News or uh, Infowars, et cetera. And that's actually one of the things that we teach in class. Like, why are people saying it in that way, right? When you spin something a certain way, you're expecting it to have a certain outcome. And honestly, um, I was I was there at a at a um, at a school board meeting. Someone said like, "Are we going to be teaching ethnic studies in these classes?" And the city council member in Santa Ana said, "Well, explain to me what critical race theory is, and then I'll let you know whether or not we're going to teach it." And that person didn't know what to say, mm -hmm. right? So they often take what they heard somewhere over there, and they reinterpret that and they put that forward. And most of the time, people who are demonizing ethnic studies have absolutely no idea what we really do. So. Yeah, I, I appreciate you being here. Um, we definitely need our counselors because we know that you're the first ones that the students come into contact with. So thank you. Sure, thank you. Any other preguntas? Any other questions, anyone? This is really good. Yes, it is. Can you share a little bit um, on the courses you offer here at Chafee and what courses will be offered in the spring? Of course. So currently we have, um, and I'll go ahead and type this in the chat. So we have six, uh, six, six different courses in ethnic studies, right? Number one through six. Um, this semester we are teaching one, two, and three. Next semester in the spring, we are teaching four, five, and six. Uh, four is African American studies, five is Asian American studies, and six is um, race identity and politics. So um, if you are interested in learning a little bit more about critical race theory, um, six might be the one that you might want to take. But this semester we're teaching one, two, and three. One is intro to ethnic studies, two is intro to Native American studies, and three is intro to Latinx studies. And um, as our program continues to grow, we will add classes, right? Um, and I will say proudly, thank you to everybody who serves on the curriculum committee, because we are now, all of our courses are approved for CSU transfer and UC transfer. So. Awesome. Yeah. And are those, and to take four, five, and six, are those, do they have a prerequisite? Do you have to take Ethnic Studies 1? No. Okay. You can just go straight into it. Awesome. And just to clarify, also, any one of these classes will will qualify for the CSU um, transfer, right? So you don't have to take like one and then four. You could just take four or five or six, whichever one uh, you're most interested in. And uh, while we are waiting for more questions, uh, for my students who are here in here in the room, uh, this is uh, the screen that you have to screenshot. Once you screenshot it, email it to me, and then uh, you get your extra credit. Uh, but uh, Sandra actually asked me about this earlier. I like to do art, and so I'd like to do a lot of really silly art. And this is me, stick figure me as Batman. So go ahead and screenshot this, and then you can go back to questions. We'll stop sharing. So we do have another question. 
Um, Jenna asks, will one, two, and three be available next fall? Mm, that's a hard maybe, right? Currently, we are only set to teach four, five, and six next semester. But if the demand is there, then we could possibly open up new sections. Um, remember that this program, this is this is the first semester that we're doing this. So we're seeing what works for the Chafee College community. Like what do our students need and what are they asking for? So if, I mean, our Dean is very, very receptive to student uh, requests. So if, if you want to uh, talk to our Dean, maybe we can offer more sections. I see Sharon, you have your hand up. Uh, if you wanna mute yourself or type it in the chat, up to you. Sharon, did you have your hand up? Oh, my mistake. Oh, she's not allowed to unmute. You should have. Oh, now I'm suddenly able to unmute, so thank <laughs> you. No problem. Um, so Jose, welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. Right, I was on your hiring committee, so it makes me so happy to have you and Patricia here. Um, but I think that like a lot of times people who are new to ethnic studies as a discipline don't understand the significance and the interdisciplinary significance that ethnic study has on all disciplines. So could you speak to a little bit about how like we have ethnic studies in all disciplines, even if it's not related, you know, like, for example, some people are like, there's no ethnic studies in science or math. I think I think it'll help our campus have an understanding of ethnic studies because I think we have an underdeveloped understanding of what ethnic studies is and it's significant. So I think that maybe like, could you speak to how ethnic studies is related to other disciplines and has a more interdisciplinary significance? Yeah, of course, thank you for bringing that up. That's actually a really, really good question. Um, so we can approach ethnic studies in one of two ways. We can approach it as a specific discipline, but we have things that we learn. And we can also approach it as, I guess you could say, a training regimen or a training module, what have you, right? So not only do we teach students the content, we also have certain pedagogical practices that we implement in our classes, right? So one thing that I'm, I'm thinking about right now is in the sciences. Right. So the sciences often don't think that they have anything to do with ethnic studies. Now, as far as, let's say, computer science. So where I went to school at Cal State Fullerton, computer science majors were 95 percent male. Right. So major, vast majority of the people that are studying computer science at Cal State Fullerton are men. Right. Now. On the surface, someone would say, well, women aren't good for this, women aren't uh, interested in this, what have you. But when we actually take an in-depth ethnic studies approach to this, we will see that the women are being pushed out of these disciplines, right? Through an ethnic studies lens, we can understand what we can do. Well, first off, identifying the problem, right? That women are being forced out of the discipline and then implementing changes so that our women are not pushed out of computer science. Now, the other thing, staying within the computer science realm, um, one of the things that I like to study is ethnic studies futurism, right? And when we think of ethnic studies, a lot of people think about it in the 1960s, right? That is typically when they think about it, civil rights movement, et cetera. Um, as far as computer science, how can computer science implement ethnic studies? We have computer programmers who typically look a certain way come from the same type of background who are then going into the internet, you know, the sphere, what have you, and they are programming in a certain way. I often ask my students when we start this lesson, can a robot be racist? And people are like, no, it's a robot, duh, like who cares, right? And then I'm like, okay, well, if a robot is being programmed by a human, if the human is racist, then that robot too, or that software too will become racist. So through ethnic studies, we can train you to see that you have a certain set of biases, 
right? That find their way into what you produce. Um, so one example, as far as, um, as far as programming is concerned is um, right now, Elon Musk and a lot of, um, a lot of computer, a lot of computer scientists and car manufacturers are trying to perfect automated drivers, right? So whenever you look at like whenever the, actually, you know what? I'm really interested, give me a second. Sorry, this is like my, my thing. Feel like I just went down the rabbit hole. Um, okay, sorry, Sandra. I'm gonna go down the rabbit no, hole. No, no worries. <laughs> okay, now, um, so I drive a Tesla, right? Um, First off, Elon Musk is a con man. We'll get to that later. But the self-driving software is programmed by people. Kind of rudimentary to say, right? But this is the way that it looks like to the computer, right? So whenever it's driving, it will identify certain things because a human being is training the AI to identify certain images. So I, I know I'm pretty sure all of you have seen these at least once. You've probably done them multiple times trying to get into your Google account, right? But every time that you click on these images, one, you're verifying that you aren't a robot, and two, you're helping train Google robots, right? So if it asks you, what does a crosswalk look like? Essentially what we're doing is we're putting lots and lots of data into the this machine and it's able to see what a crosswalk looks like in various angles at night, during the day, when it's raining, when it's snowing, et cetera. And the way that it does this is you take millions and millions and millions of pictures and you feed it to the machine. But the problem here though, is if, if let's say, okay, you all can see this, it's a bumblebee, right? If the bumblebee is like this, the machine recognize, aha, that's a bumblebee. But if I make this image black and white, the machine's like, what, what is that? It's a brand new thing. If I flip this image upside down, the machine will go, what is that? It, it treats it at a, as a brand new thing. So now where, what am I leading to? If I'm programming this car to not hit other cars or to not hit human beings, I first have to program into this machine what a human being looks like. So then ask yourself, how could this become racist? Well, we also have to say, what does a nose look like? What do, what do a standard human lips look like? What do standard human eyes look like? And what you'll see is if all of these programmers are white men, they are going to treat human beings based on their own facial features. That eyes have to look a certain way, noses have to look a certain way, skin colors have to look a certain way. And we've kind of seen this in the past, for those of you who have cameras like this, right? There is a programmer who programmed facial recognition in a certain way. So to them, eyes had to have a certain shape. So if you have someone with smaller eyes, it might think that that person is blinking, when in fact, to that person, that person has their eyes wide open. Now, okay, long story, circle is almost complete. If I'm programming human beings to look only like white people, when these cars start running over black people or start running over Mexicans, right, then we're going to see, oh, wow, look, this is how computer software can be racist with self-driving cars. That literally, it does not treat black people or Mexicans as human beings because it constantly runs over them. But when you run, when it's coming to a white person, the car stops because the car treats them like a human being. So... <laughs> sorry uh, <laughs> no, you're hole. okay um and there's actually a really good documentary coded by it yeah that yeah. speaks upon this yeah that's actually the documentary that i use when i'm teaching this yeah, so yeah it's, highly it's a, recommend it highly recommend it's available it. on netflix right and sandra can attest it's a good documentary mm -hmm. yeah yeah well, well thank you for that rabbit hole journey <laughs> <laughs>
Um, now we have four minutes left. Do we have any last minute questions, comments? Let's see, Cindy added in the chat. Ruha Benjamin also has a lot of good info on tech bias. So yeah, and especially now since our society is gravitating more towards tech, um, that's where we're really gonna see what, you know, all the biases that exist, implicit, explicit, and so forth. We have time for one more, if mm -hmm. anyone wants to ask any final questions. I'll ask the final question. What's your vision for the ethnic studies program here at Chiefs? Um, how do I put this? And, may, and maybe Professor Gomez can chime in a little bit. Um, we have a really good opportunity to become a very large department because the need is here. Um, I grew up in the area and I can definitely tell you that the demand is there. Um, we immediately want to be able to create an A, well, in the near future, to create an AA degree in ethnic studies, right? And as far as each one of the individual courses of study. Um, but honestly, for me, immediately for me, um, I was an adjunct professor for almost 10 years, um, I want to set down roots here and I want to make sure that everybody knows, one, that ethnic studies is not a thing to be scared of, that ethnic studies is actually this really, really cool thing that people can study. Um, I wanna make sure that we are involved in the community, right? That people out there, like local churches and local um, community organizations that they know that ethnic studies at Chafee College is someone that you can approach, right? It's not. Um, we're not ivory tower in any in any sense of the word, right? But um, definitely setting down roots for myself and you know for Professor Gomez. Um, Professor Gomez, did you want to add anything to that? Thank you for inviting me on this question. Yeah, I I envision ethnic studies department at JP College uh, growing into a robust program uh, and more so not just in the classroom, right? Uh, theory to practice, but in the community, uh, more community events, uh, more reaching out to our students, more involving our students and their family, their tias, their tios, their siblings to come onto campus and, you know, remove and unblock whatever it is, right? That stigma of, oh, college is not, you know, somewhere where we sit, but, but really somewhere where we're welcomed, right? And um, somewhere where we can remove that imposter syndrome for our students, for sure. And if Chafe, if someone in the community thinks, oh, well, college is not for me, what can we do? How can we change so that it is for you? Because there could be something that we are very, very behind on, right? That we are, we would not have been aware of had it not been for our engagement in the community, right? So this is for everybody. Um, please tell your, your family members. I used to always go home after my Chicano studies classes and I used to like talk to my parents, like, did you know this? Did you know this? Like, we definitely want to see that happen here. Yeah, of course. And thank you both, um, Professor Zamora and Gomez, for being here. Welcome, just like everybody in the chat is welcoming you to Chafee College. We are very fortunate to have both of you here join our community. Um, and I believe our time is up, but I did want to thank Professor Zamora for the engaging, dynamic, and um, artistic presentation. I enjoyed it very much and I hope all of you enjoyed it as well. Um, thank you all once again for joining us for our Ethnic Studies Explained and please catch us either in person or online for Thursday's um, lecture discussion TED Talk with Professor Patricia Gomez. Thank you everybody.